So we move on with our mini symposium about skeletal dysplasias. We all know it's a challenging patient population and we are eager to see where the traps are, where the difficulties are and how to avoid mistakes. So our first speaker is Paul Sponsela about achondroplasia. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to pre present a brief overview of this condition and some of the uh, basic science behind it and certainly the spine traps that can uh, await you. We'll talk about the pathogenesis and maybe some future treatment opportunities. Achondroplasia is caused by a, a gene that was discovered in 1995, uh, affects fibroblast, fibroblast growth factor receptor protein 3, and it's almost always the same mutation. 99% of the time it's the same amino acid mutated, and it, this is pretty rare for genetic disorders. Uh, it's an autosomal dominant condition, which is 100% penetrant if it's present. Most people get it by a spontaneous mutation, and one of the risk factors for that is advanced paternal age. The molecular pre, uh, prenatal diagnos diagnosis is now possible. This gene causes a gain of function. This mutation causes uh, a gain of function of the normal function of FGFR3, which inhibits proliferation of cartilage cells. In the presence of the mutation, you have overactivity of this inhibition, and the cartilage cells stop proliferating, leading to short stature and shortness of the pedicles, stenosis of the spinal canal, and some undergrowth uh, of the thoracolumbar junction. This mechanism does provide, surprisingly, some potential opportunities for intervention. Translational research has shown that a uh, uh, natriuretic peptide uh, can block this inhibition, and so there's a clinical trial going on to uh, look at the p potential effect of this and maybe some other interventions to blunt the uh, growth stoppage, uh, and there may be some hopes for future uh, improvement in this natural history. Medically, you should be aware that your patients, especially the young ones, are at risk for obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, and referrals to pulmonology, ENT, uh, there are some ways that that can be helped by tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy, uh, nighttime uh, breathing aids. They can also have central sleep apnea, uh, especially due to foramen magnum stenosis, which along with the spinal stenosis is due to this growth disturbance. Many children who have it early on can grow out of it, but not all, and some of them need a foramen magnum decompression. If you're familiar with skeletal dysplasias, you know that their problems fall along certain themes, including upper cervical stability, up, upper cervical instability, uh, thoracolumbar kyphosis, scoliosis, and stenosis. Well, achondroplasia, which is by far the most common skeletal dysplasia, does not have some of these things. It almost never has any kind of upper cervical issue, and there is rarely any scoliosis. But the two things that plague these young people and, and then adults are thoracolumbar kyphosis, and especially a persistent and pernicious spinal stenosis, which just gets worse over time. The early onset foramen magnum stenosis and spinal stenosis arises because of undergrowth of the transverse growth plates. We talked this morning about the neurocentral synchondrosis. This is a specimen radiograph of a, a vertebra showing where the neurocentral central synchondroses are, and they have uh, they have zonation just like the long growth plates we're familiar with in the lower extremities. And uh, these failures of growth result in stenosis, especially in the lower lumbar spine, uh, and that can become um, compounded by infolding the ligament of flavum. Any kind of disc issue just really tips them over the edge because they have no uh, reserve in their spinal canal. So the key issues that come to us in the spine are how to manage the kyphosis, uh, whether or not to use bracing and how, uh, the indications for spinal fusion, and the extent of that spinal fusion. Thoracolumbar kyphosis in achondroplasia is characteristic. More, almost 90% of patients in the first year of life have this hypotonic thoracolumbar kyphosis, but they tend to grow out of it. The etiology is just uh, delayed sit delayed uh, muscle control, delayed extensor mechanism function, and so they sag, and some of them get some growth inhibition by a Huter-Volkman law, but most of them can grow out of it if they 
develop their milestones uh, in, in a relatively good order. Here's an example of how sometimes it goes wrong. This is a patient I saw at uh, six months of age and then not again until 13 years of age, and so she ended up with this mild wedging of T12, which became severe uh, by the time she's 13 and required significant vertebral column uh, surgery. We did a study of thoracolumbar kyphosis in young children at our place, and we found that about 70% uh, resolved completely, 30% had some persistent thoracolumbar kyphosis uh, uh, in final follow-up, and then depending on how severe that kyphosis was, they may or may not need any intervention. If the kyphosis was more than 40 degrees, they tended to have a high chance of symptomatic spinal stenosis and ended up with fusion. If it was between 20 and 40, they tended to do well, and very few of them had uh, significant spinal issues. The radiographic predictors of persistent kyphosis had to do with the, uh, the apical wedging and the apical translation of that vertebra. So here's a line drawing showing uh, the measurement of the thoracolumbar translation and then uh, of the wedging that you can measure. And if they have either of those features, there's a good chance that they will not grow out of it. Developmental delay as well can predict that. If children are late in sitting beyond 14 months or late in walking beyond 30 months, they have a much greater chance of persistent thoracolumbar kyphosis and problem from that. So does bracing help this? There's really no data on that point. We often do try it. It has to be a specially made brace. Uh, some patients tolerate it, many don't. And in most patients just end up kind of uh, observing natural history. The indications for spinal fusion include any thoracolumbar decompression for stenosis in an immature patients. They must have instrumentation because otherwise they will develop a severe progressive uh, worsening of their kyphosis. For deformity alone, there is no fixed indication for fusion, but if they have painful kyphosis or uh, progressive kyphosis, it's pretty certain that they will need a decompression, and so many times we will uh, t undertake that at uh, adolescence. Here's an example of a patient who ha had some interval improvement, a 14-month-old with uh, moderate wedging. Uh, he did start to walk at that time, and he grew out of it, uh, but he had a persistent 40-degree curve, and uh, by the time he reached uh, adolescence, he started to have cl claudication, squatting after walking, neurogenic claudication, developed a temporary foot drop, and had to undergo uh, decompression and instrumentation. In this case, from uh, uh, instrumentation was extended down to, T4, to L4. When you do these cases, it's important not to overcorrect. I just correct to the best prone position, uh, and that is, I think, uh, puts them in physiologic balance. Operative issues with achondroplasia include a very high risk of intraoperative neuromonitoring changes because, again, they have no reserve. You should avoid anything that goes into the canal. The pedicle features are mostly workable. Uh, they tend to have pedicles that'll fit a five, six, or seven millimeter screw, but the, the length dimensions of those pedicles are usually down by about a centimeter from what you would see in an adult at any given level. There is, however, a risk of uh, dural violation because there is so much stenosis. Any work around the ligament of flavum, any revision work will often uh, <coughs> result in a dural tear. And if you have a dural tear, it's very distressing because the nerve roots are packed in there and they kind of, <coughs> they kind of uh, spurt out at you. And so it's uh, kind of uh, difficult repair many times. One of the operative issues is uh, wondering whether you should fuse to the sacrum. There is some controversy about that point. Uh, at our place, uh, Michael Ain felt we should not fuse to the sacrum. I had a lower threshold for doing that, so we were able to study our two populations and compare them. And those who were fused to the sacrum early on had a lower rate of restenosis, which can be very hard to operate on in an older adult. But they do have some increased difficulties with per personal care. So I have personally still a low threshold because I think these are miserable operations to go have, have to redo in uh, adults uh, when they start to get more stenosis. Here's another case of an eight-year-old who had achondroplasia, status post foramen magnum decompression, so you already know he's kind of a challenged, higher involved case. He developed neurogenic claudication confirmed by MRI. He was decompressed and fused, uh, but then he ended up adding on above, uh, so we extended him uh, <clears throat> to T9. Uh, he ended up, uh, again, having 
an add-on above that, but it was gradual and it was well tolerated, and so he never had to have any further uh, <clears throat> extension beyond that. Patients who do have to come and have surgery in adulthood, I think, are very challenging. Combined cases with usually neurosurgery and orthopedics, and these patients are fraught with difficulty. Uh, so I think you have to try to take care of them early on and uh, do an extensive fusion to protect the very vulnerable uh, neuraxis at the bottom. So in summary, 70% of children will walk out of their kyphosis. The efficacy of bracing is tried but unknown. I think you should be, be clear to instrument any decompressions that are done in adolescence, correcting them only to the prone amount of kyphosis that they have on the table, and be judicious about fusion to the sacrum. At all levels of life, I think the geneticist is a very valuable uh, adjunct, and these are almost functioning as their primary doctors many times. Uh, so you should involve the geneticist uh, in the care of these patients. Thank you.